uh, indeed introducing myself. I work for the Amsterdam Institute for Global Health and Development, and I'm program director of the FP7 funded uh, Hoekvak consortium. And within this consortium, we try to uh, establish one simple, simple goal, and that is to develop a vaccine uh, for hookworm disease. Um, now, I've been asked to talk about funding challenges, and Jean-Francois just uh, had a good overview of the different sort of macroeconomic challenges that we all face in uh, product development for neglected diseases. What I would like to do in these uh, hopefully 10 minutes, is to give you a bit of a flavor what it actually takes on a project level. So what are our challenges, being just a group of passionate scientists that want to bring a good product to the children who are in need. Um, this is probably also a sort of uh, description of the valley of hunger. Imagine lunch being on the right and yourself <laughs> being on the left. Um, it's sort of how we scientists feel about drug development and vaccine development as well. You know, you have a good idea, you're standing there at the edge, and there at the other side of the valley, there are the investors. Um, but they're just telling you, well, you know, do this one animal study, you do a bit of formulation work, do this clinical uh, proof of concept study. It's just quite difficult to get uh, your product to a stage where people are actually willing to fund. And that's true for... Um, products that have a commercial market. It's especially true for products in uh, neglected uh, diseases. So I guess we as a group have been actually quite uh, lucky by getting awarded this 7 million or 6 million grant for, uh, the, for the development of our vaccine. It basically allows us to do three uh, different things. It allows us to further uh, work on the uh, more downstream development of the vaccine development and manufacturing. It allows for clinical testing of the vaccine, and it also allows for a bit of advocacy. And why the last point is so important, I would like to emphasize in this talk. So this is the consortium. Uh, it's actually a nice collaboration between European partners, the American partners that were the originators of the vaccine, and a site in Gabon uh, where all the clinical studies are going to be conducted. <coughs> And this is a, a picture of the animal that we're going to target. Uh, it's a highly prevalent uh, neglected disease. And it's one of the leading causes of anemia in low- and middle-income countries. Um, it's a very common disease. It's leading uh, among the NTD list, among with uh, schistosomiasis and leishmaniasis. Over 400 million cases, uh, 3.2 million uh, dailies lost. Um, and it's also a disease that is related to poverty. Um, so it primarily affects uh, people who are poor, but it also increases uh, and, and, and amplifies poverty. So it leads to reduction in wage earning. Um, I'll go through these slides pretty quick to get to the real point about the funding challenges. This is just uh, giving an overview of the uh, life cycle of the worm. It eventually ends up in the intestines, um, and um, affected uh, individuals can have many worms, but 25 of these worms already translate to one milligram, um, one minimal of blood loss, and that's already equivalent to the daily iron intake of a child. Um, so what it actually leads to is clear anemia, which you see in the um, uh, the, the two slides here, and the, the, the take-home message is the more burden of the worms you have, the more severe your anemia becomes. Um, so the originators of this vaccine um, are people working in the Sabin Vaccine Institute uh, in the United States. And their work started in uh, 2000 and was actually funded originally by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we're quite happy now that the European Commission has taken over through this um, uh, FP7 grant, and what we're developing is a bivalent vaccine that has actually two antigens in it that are fairly relevant for the worm to um, um, basically um, break down the blood that it's ingesting. And the two antigens are being produced in two separate um, uh, recombinant processes. And one of the things that we're trying to do in this project is actually 
uh, transfer that technology into a sort of more easy technology uh, that is uh, better scalable than the current uh, uh, technologies. Um, this is just a proof of principle in animals, just to make the point that it's not totally out of uh, the uh, textbooks, but it also has a practical um, um, sort of uh, evidence uh, in dogs. What you see here in the, um, basically the picture over there is that the uh, antibodies end up in the small intestines where they're supposed to work. You can see in the graph that the dogs that were vaccinated had a higher hemoglobin level than the con con controls. And in the bottom uh, graph, you can see that the uh, dogs that were vaccinated had a lower uh, burden of, uh, of worm eggs. Um, so we have in FIFO proof of concept of the uh, vaccine candidates in animals, and it's now up to the HOOKVAC program to establish that that also works in humans. Um, today we learned about a vaccine that has about 50% efficacy. Uh, uh, we also believe that our vaccine is not going to be amongst the group that will have 100% efficacy. So therefore we think that the vaccine by itself is an addition to the current interventions. And one of the important interventions that is out there at this point in time is mass drug administrations. So what we have demonstrated by modeling is that actually by adding the vaccine to MDA campaigns, you can actually um, improve the curve of the epidemic and you can actually uh, have a significant benefit on the amount of delis lost. Um, this is the work plan within the program. There's much more on the manufacturing side and on the efficacy, the efficacy side, but this is what we're going to do with clinical trials. So in July, we're going to start our first phase one clinical trial in healthy volunteers. Um, that's followed by a clinical trial in uh, school-aged children who are the ultimate uh, target uh, population for the vaccine. And then the last study that is planned is a challenge study. So that's a study where volunteers are being vaccinated and then subsequently challenged with the worm which is quite an innovative design. It's being used in malaria studies at the moment and also influenza vaccine studies. It has not been used in worm studies before, but we think it's a great opportunity because if we have a successful readout from this study, it will be a very early indicator that the vaccine will work in humans. So we don't have to wait until phase 2b studies to get our first um, proof of e e efficacy. And that by itself, I think, is already uh, um, a very important innovation if it comes to the cost of doing vaccine clinical studies. Um, one word about the vaccine, and then I will move more towards the challenges that we face. But you know, the, the, the ultimate grill that we have in mind, the ultimate goal, is that we develop a successful vaccine. If we manage to do so, we will be able to avoid uh, up to 300 million uh, dailies. It will improve pregnancy and birth outcomes. It will improve cognitive in uh, development of children. And therefore, it will prevent a lot of human suffering. So this is all nice and good. Uh, but we realize that in the complex trajectory of vaccine development, we're only about 30% of the way or so. And um, you know, being transitioning to phase one clinical studies, we also get to the point of what you see here, industrial investment needed in order to um, further move your vaccine forward. Um, remember that I just showed you that we had a six million grant from the European Commission. Um, it only helps us uh, for a very limited part of the overall development of a vaccine. And you know, if you read the, read the lit different literature estimates about what it takes to um, develop a vac vaccine, the sort of most conservative estimate is 100 million. Some less conservative estimates even go beyond a billion dollars. Um, so clearly, um, we need to do more to get a vaccine to the market. And who is going to help us with that? Um, the first obvious uh, partners to look at um, for obvious reasons are the pharmaceutical companies that develop vaccine products. We have to realize, though, that pharmaceutical, uh, the, the pharmaceutical development or that, that 
um, vaccine development is only a small fraction of the uh, total sales of worldwide pharma. So it's only one and a half to three percent. And there's also a limited number of players in this field. And what you see in the right panel is already a somewhat outdated figure. We know from recent newspaper coverage that GSK and Novartis have some uh, plans to join their forces. J&J &J is not yet on that slide. They were not in the field in 2007. They are now um, uh, after they acquired uh, Crucel. Um, but nonetheless, the number of industrial partners is limited, especially compared to the world of pharmaceuticals. Um, you also see a category other in here, uh, and that merely reflects upcoming economies where more and more uh, manufacturers start to get uh, pre-qualification. Um, and we think that that category other can be very important for us. I'll come back to that uh, in a few slides. Skip this one for the sake of time. Um, and just want to um, you know, add another um, uh, element to the macroeconomic discussion that Jean-Francois already uh, mentioned. And it is that Europe always has been very strong in the vaccine field, traditionally, um, but it's sort of losing ground. The, the, the positive interpretation of this slide is that you can see that the amount of funding available for vaccine R&D is clearly increasing. So that's very, very good. What we find a bit worrying is that the amount of European uh, uh, part of this is actually decreasing. Um, and obviously these, fer these figures vary from year to year. I think, uh, you know, this goes to 2008. If we extrapolate this figure to 2013 and 2014, the European Commission will definitely do better. Uh, the Hoekvak uh, project is a demonstration of that. But I think it's important that Europe uh, keeps focus on the fact that um, you know, it has always been good in vaccine development and it needs to remain to do so over the years to come. Um, one thing that we find particularly worrisome is that um, for, for most vaccine development in entities, we have to have uh, PDPs for the product development. It has been discussed at several of the uh, discussions to today. This was already covered by Jean-Francois, but what I would like to show you is this particular graph. So if you look at the G Finder report of uh, policy cures, you know, all the figures are actually on the rise or quite stable, which by itself is quite an achievement given the fact that we had such a deep economic crisis over the last five years. But the one thing that hasn't increased is the amount of funding in PDPs. Um, actually, the amount of funding of PDPs is on the decline, and it has been so for a couple of years already, 20% in 2012. The reason for that is perhaps a bit up to debate. Um, you know, one interpretation is that it's a reflection of the fact that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been so instrumental in funding the early years of PDPs are slowly getting out of this field or reorienting their uh, funding. But obviously, other parties need to step in because the big challenge for vaccine development in neglected diseases is this trend is not, is not banded, uh, where we really will run into serious problems. Um, another way to um, look at this is actually looking at the amount of R&D funding compared to the amount of delis that is actually lost by a particular category of diseases. And what you can clearly see here in the slide is this tremendous bias that the pharmaceutical industry has towards chronic diseases. Chronic diseases translates into chronic treatment and therefore much more affordable business models than for a vaccine where you know, almost by definition you only have a single dose or maybe three shots that would be enough to cure a patient from a disease. Um, so $71 per daily lost for the non-communicable diseases as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer. If we get to the neglected diseases, including the big three, it's $14. If we take out the big three, it's $10. And then if we get down to my field, which is the helmet diseases, then we get to $6. And perhaps from a public health perspective, even more worrisome, if you take bacterial diarrhea and bacterial pneumonia, which are big killers, uh, which are faced by an epidemic of increasing drug resistance and multi-drug resistance, we see that only $2 per, 
per daily uh, is being spent, per, per daily loss is being spent. And that's a, that's, a, that, that's a challenge for development of products in neglected diseases, but it's also a challenge for us in the West. If we don't do something about the growing epidemic of gram-negative infections, uh, if we don't do something about M MRSA and other gram-positive infections, we will have a significant public health issue in this part of the world as well. But coming back to our uh, program, um, I've talked about a, a bit about the development, the development cost in R&D. There's also the issue of delivery. Um, it takes at the moment in a development country about $30 to get a child fully immunized. Um, and that number is actually not met in a significant part of the world. This slide comes from the Seventh Vaccine Institute that did a survey in 15 of the countries where they have specific programs running. Um, and what you see here is that the amount of funds available for child immunization is actually on the increase. That's the positive news, news on this slide, but it's nowhere where it needs to be. Um, with only $10 in these countries in 10, 2010. A new vaccines like ours are only to increase the cost, not to decrease the cost. So we need to do something on the delivery side as well. And then, as a group, we face that funding is not the only hurdle. Um, so if you, for example, talk about WHO pre-qualification, what you need at some point in time if you're developing a vaccine, you have, to, you have to go through this process that is supposed to guarantee the quality and the safety uh, and efficacy of the vaccines that come to the market. Um, the problem with that is that uh, the current policy is that vaccines are only being put on the vaccine priority list, as you see in the last bullet point. Um, if they're high priority vaccines, if you're a low priority vaccine, your placement on that list may actually be postponed and then they say depending on the workload uh, that they have. That's a nice way of saying at this point in time we only put vaccines on the list that are actually preventing mortality. So if you're developing a vaccine that's targeted towards preventing morbidity, um, then currently you cannot get on the list. So despite all the funding that we now get from the European Commission, despite all the funding issues that we still have and all the scientific challenges, there's also the element that we need to do advocacy to make sure that that priority list is going to change because we believe and strongly believe that morbidity-related vaccines also should get on that list. And that's not going to be an easy task because the same group that does the pre-qualification also has to take into account that the complexity of the products that get into the market are becoming increasing. There are many new manufacturers from developing countries. What's listed here is China and Thailand, but we can easily add to that list Iran, Cuba, Bangladesh. So there's a lot of extra effort that they need to do in terms of qualification of all those manufacturers. There's more attention for regional uh, issues. Um, so vaccine development traditionally has always been for global issues. There may now be regional pockets that you regionally want to target with specific vaccines, and perhaps hookworm is part of that. So there's a lot of challenges that these people need to go through, and that's within a setting where actually their staffing is actually less, not more than it was in 2008. So the last part, two minutes more, and then I'm done. What needs to change? Um, well, first, on a general level, I think that we here in Europe have to be aware that we need to stay ahead uh, in this field. We need to make sure that Europe is and remain strong in the vaccine development field, including the field for neglected diseases. Um, for our project, we have identified that it's important for us to liaise early with these manufacturers from developing countries. Our ultimate goal is to transfer these technologies or the technology around our vaccine strategy to manufacturers in developing countries with the goal to produce a vaccine that can be marketed for one dollar or less. We see it as our task to be an advocate to change the rules for pre-qualification. We think that our vaccine actually can have a lot of benefit in preventing disease and that should be a reason to get on the priority list as well. And we are aware that 
apart from the fact that we're very happy that we got the 6 million euros, we need to raise a lot more funds. So that's what we're going to do in the next coming years. Um, I skipped that one uh, just to mention that we are currently applying for a Europe aid grant uh, that hopefully will help us to liaise with these uh, manufacturers in developing countries. And rather than giving a whole list of names that uh, um, should be recognized for composition of this talk, I would like to show a slide of the staff that attended the kickoff meeting of our consortium in Amsterdam. Um, and that's it. Thank you.